Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Concordia University presents the Walrus Talks Living Better. I'm Shelley Ambrose, the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be here on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people in Canada's capital city, a place with a rich history and a bright future. Thank you for joining us at the National Gallery of Canada. We know that there is a, a, a big tradition of conversation at this place, and we are really happy to be here to continue that conversation. This optimistic project called The Walrus started 16 years ago, so we're a teenager. We recognize that Canada's conversation is complex and necessary, and so, as you know, it takes many forms at The Walrus. We create conversations through fact-based journalism in The Walrus magazine, daily at thewalrus.ca, and by publishing the walrus books, and in rooms like this from coast to coast to coast. So no matter where the walrus is or how you consume it, we embrace our commitment to be independent and to bring together interesting and interested people who care about the issues that matter. Here's my favorite game. How many people, who reads the walrus? Yay! Who supports the Walrus Journalism financially by subscribing or donating? <laughs> Those are my favorite people. Yay! Hello to my people. Hands up if you've been to a Walrus Talks before. Welcome back. Hands up if you're new. This is when we welcome the new people. There is no way we can do the work that we do without you. It would be really, really sad if I were here all by myself. So thank you for coming. And there is also no way we can do the work that we do without our partners. Our strongest, longest partnership is with Concordia University. We have some Concordia alumni with us tonight, I believe. Where are you? Hello, Concordians. Thank you for being with us. We've been working with Concordia for several stellar years as part of their Thinking Out Loud series. This year, Concordia enabled the Walrus for the first time in our history to host uh, a conversation about Canada outside of Canada. We, uh, Concordia took the Walrus Talks to New York City in the spring where we had a conversation about the Can-US uh, conversation. You can watch that one online, interesting times for that very long relationship. So thank you, Concordia. Since we met with Concordia now years ago, we've always been very impressed by the way they design programs to prepare their alumni to be at the forefront of innovation in all sectors and to use their education and research to make a better world. To tell us more, please welcome Concordia University's interim president and vice chancellor, Graham Carr. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, merci tout le monde d'être venu ce soir. Uh, we've had a terrific partnership with the Walrus magazine, as Shelley said, for uh, for a number of years, and and I think that's partly because both the magazine and the university love partnerships and believe that partnerships are the way of the future. Uh, 24 hours ago, we were just about to start our third fall convocation of the day. Uh, we graduated about uh, 2,000 students yesterday. That's in addition to the 6,000 that we graduated in the spring convocation. So you can do the math on the 2019 recolte. But one of the things you might also have seen yesterday if you were reading the Globe and Mail was that we gave an honorary doctorate to Barbara Davidson, one of our uh, graduates who's a prize-winning photojournalist. In fact, she's won three Pulitzer Prizes uh, uh, in the United States and currently has a Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as to uh, Annette Verschuren, who I'm sure is familiar to many people here for her work with uh, Home Depot and now NR Store and as a consultant to, uh, 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 to, to government. Um, it was a very successful day, uh, but I wanted to also mention the numbers, 2,000 and 6,000, because it tells you something about the size of the university. We were founded in 1974, we're slightly older than the Walrus, and we have now about 53,000 students in Montreal. Um, but we're also, by, universities, by global university standards, a young university, under 50, 
And in the under 50 category, both Times Higher Education and QS have ranked Concordia as the top North American university under 50 for the last two years, and that's something we're very proud of. Why is that the case? Well, our John Molson School of Business uh, was just last week ranked by Bloomberg in the top 100 in the world for its MBA program, one of four Canadian universities and the only one in Quebec to be in the top 100. To put that in perspective, there are 16,000 MBA programs around the world. Our fine arts faculty is ranked in the top 100 in the world and certainly is the largest and we like to believe the top in Canada. And our Gina Cody School of Engineering is ranked uh, eighth in terms of engineering and computer science in Canada. So I think we're living well under 50 and hoping to live better in the future. And we are a next generation university determined to do things differently. And if I can steal a cliche from someone familiar, uh, go to where the puck isn't in terms of our priority. <laughs> a big part of our success stems from our diversity. 20% of our students are international, coming from more than 150 countries. Plus de 20% de nos étudiants parlent français comme langue maternelle, et plus de 30% de nos étudiants parlent une langue autre de l'anglais ou français comme langue maternelle. And, and tonight you're going to hear uh, Krista Byron's Highland talking about the importance of bilingualism. We believe that diversity is part of what makes us an innovative place. And having the only engineering school in North America named for a woman, named for a woman, immigrant woman from Iran, Gina Cody, is another uh, symbol of that. If I can just talk about a couple of other initiatives, you may have seen in the last couple of weeks, it was certainly very big news in uh, Montreal and in Quebec, uh, a major study on the quality of drinking water across Canada, and in particular, the measurement of lead intake in water. That was a study that was the largest investigative journalism project ever carried out in Canada. It involved more than 120 uh, students, um, uh, news outlets from L'Ivoire to Toronto Star to Associated Press to Global News. And it was led out of the Institute for Investigative Journalism at Concordia University. And it had an instantaneous impact in Montreal with both the Premier of Quebec and the, uh, and the Mayoress of Montreal uh, coming out of their offices to announce that there would be changes in the public policy around uh, water, uh, water purity measurement uh, in their jurisdictions. I mentioned that we like to go where the puck ain't. I would also just point out that today we have the largest university-led cybersecurity lab in all of Canada. The reason for that is that we started working on cybersecurity in the university context long before many other universities did. We have also opened the first synthetic biology biofoundry in Canada, part of a 15 uh, university global consortium uh, in that platform technology of the fourth industrial revolution. Last week, we announced the first industrial research chair in blockchain, blockchain technology in partnership with uh, Raymond uh, Grant Thornton. And health, which is part of the theme for tonight, is an area that we do uh, incredibly innovative things in for a university that doesn't have a medical faculty but still makes contributions to health discourse uh, by focusing on healthy aging, aging in technology, preventive health, among other things. The last thing I would say as we're talking about living better is the importance of sustainability. And you may have read, I hope you did, two weeks ago that our Concordia University Foundation became the first uh, endowment fund manager at a university in Quebec and we believe in Canada to make a commitment to be invested in 100% sustainable investments by 2025. Uh, and we're very proud of that, uh, of that decision, uh, which we think uh, differentiates us. So I will stop there, other than to say for those of you who are Concordia alumni in the room, I hope you're proud of what we're doing. And for those of you who are not, in the era of lifelong learning, there's still time. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Graham, and thanks again to everyone at Concordia for thinking out loud with us. That is an exhausting list of things you are doing. Seriously, congratulations, it's unbelievable. The way we live in Canada is, well, the way anyone lives anywhere, really, but the way we live in Canada is changing at an incredible, sometimes perhaps alarming pace. And we all have a desire to live better and healthier in our relationships, our communities, our work, and as global citizens. Tonight, we'll hear from seven talkers, writers, scientists, advocates, musicians, songwriters, about opportunities and obstacles to living better. The Walrus, Talk, the Walrus Talks is a format designed to bring you many perspectives. The goal is to get us all thinking and with hope to walk away to the post-talks reception to which you are all invited, thinking, I never thought of it that way. Here's how the Walrus Talks works. Each talker has seven minutes. They know this. <laughs> Each will come up and introduce themselves. You follow along on the program that was handed to you when you came in. The front of the program is the speaker order. The back of the program is their bios. I am not going to pop up and introduce each of them to you. You can follow along. They will introduce themselves. So just before uh, I let them get underway, I would like to thank them each in advance. Thank you to singer, songwriter, and mental health and recovery advocate Sean McCann. Thank you to Assistant Professor of Management at the John Molson School of Business, Joel Bethello. Thank you to architect Donald Schmidt. Thank you to co-founder of Anima Leadership and an author, Anahid Dashgard. Thank you to writer, musician, and broadcaster, Krista Kutcher. Thank you to Associate Professor of Psychology and Concordia University Research Chair in Bilingualism, Krista Ryers-Hainan. Krista Breyers hainan And thank you to technology and culture writer, Navneet Alang. Thank you all. I will just say that we have a real special treat for you tonight because usually Walworth talkers talk, but tonight your first talkers are going to also sing. Let us begin. Hi, my name is Sean, and I'm an alcoholic. And this is the strangest meeting I've been to in a long time. I, uh, you may know me from a band called Great Big C. Yeah? I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm a founding member of Great Big C, and we, um, we spent a good 20 years of our life uh, traveling back and forth across this country, uh, bringing Saturday night to everywhere we went, no matter where we went, whether it was Tuesday in Winnipeg or Wednesday in Victoria, every night for us was Saturday night. And we took our job seriously, none more so than I. And, um, you know, as an alcoholic, being in a band like Great Big C, I felt like I'd won the lottery. I really did. And things were going really well until they weren't. And when I uh, turned 40, I'm 52 now, believe it or not. When I turned 40, I started to have <clears throat> blackouts. I would drink so much, and we drank a lot, that I would uh, forget where I, you know, I couldn't remember the way the evening would end. I'd wake up and be confused. And it was very scary. I was losing control. And as these continued, I started to suspect that I might have a problem. So I did what I've learned since that many addicts do. Uh, I went to Google and I searched, am I an alcoholic? And what'll come up is a series of questionnaires and tests you can do yourself. And I passed those with flying colors. And I knew what I was, an alcoholic. And that didn't fill me with fear. I mean, I'm, I generally was a pretty good problem solver. I was a high-functioning alcoholic. We ran a really strong business. And 
made lots of money on our Saturday nights every night. And um, so I figured, you know, it's just another problem. I'll solve it. We'll move forward. But for the first time in my life, I experienced real failure because I couldn't stop. I quit for a week, and then I'd get back on the great big bus, and I'd open the fridge, and I was gone again. And that failure, those failures, made me feel depressed, which made me want to drink more. So I was stuck in a very dangerous and dark place. And I did finally stop. Um, I stopped on November 9th, 2011. And uh, people often ask me how I managed to, to actually pull that off, given the situation and the lifestyle I was living. And the truth is, I embraced my higher power. And her name is Andrea. She's my wife. She gave me an ultimatum. And I heard that. She loved me enough to risk it all. So I stopped. But there was an instant side effect to that in taking control of my life back. The first thing that happened to me was I lost all my friends. My phone stopped ringing and I was alone. And I went out and I bought a bottle of whiskey because I was vulnerable, alone, and trying to, to deal with this. So I was so tempted, I bought this bottle of whiskey, Lagavulin, bought it home, put it on my counter. And I stared at it for a long time. And I knew what the consequences would be if I opened that bottle. But I, stepped, I kept looking at it. I wanted that bottle. And in my peripheral vision that day, I saw another shape. I saw this guitar. This is old brown. And instead of picking up that bottle, I picked up old brown. This was the friend who never left. And I poured my heart into this guitar, and I wrote the first song I wrote as a sober human being. And I want to sing that with you now in my remaining two minutes and 31 seconds. Been a long time now since you left me here alone, but I don't mind because I have grown and I feel alright. Something must be wrong. I'm taking my time, I'm singing my song because I am stronger. Yes. It was one big lie. Now I can't believe my eyes. But I'm not the kind who lay down and die. You can me once, that's on me. I'll try it twice, and you will see that I am Stronger. better every day. I am, Stronger. and I've got something to say. I am Stronger. deeper than the sea. I am Stronger. than I ever used to be. You guys are good singers. When it all comes down, you'll be nowhere to be found. But I'll be standing here, I'll still be around, and I'll take this old guitar, and I'll fill it with my heart, and I'll show the world I'm ready to make a brand new start, cause I am better every day, I am, I've got some things to say, I am, deeper than the sea, I am. If it takes a thousand years for the truth to break, I will overcome my fear. I'll set that record straight. And I'll be stronger than all your sticks and stones. I am stronger. I know where I'm going. I am Something to say I am Deeper than the sea I am Than I ever used to be I am the Eggman I am the Eggman I am the walrus Thank you, walruses Walrus on John
Good evening. My name is Joel Bethello, and my work is about the imposter syndrome. I'm sure many of you in the audience know that feeling. You know that doubt about whether you're an expert, about whether you know something about anything. That creeping sensation that you're going to be discovered as a fraud. In many ways, imposterhood is an impediment to living better. It encroaches on health and wellness by increasing stress, anxiety, and depression. In my work, I seek to understand who suffers from it, what drives it, and more importantly, how to manage it. So some extraordinary people have reported this feeling of imposterhood and self-doubt. The renowned African-American poet before she died, Maya Angelou, remarked, I've written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, that's it, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody. The acclaimed novelist John Green writes, I have on countless occasions felt that I'm literally the worst writer on earth. I still don't feel like I know how to write a novel, and at this point, I doubt that I ever will. Then there's Dr. Margaret Chan, the former director of the World Health Organization, who says, there are an awful lot of people out there who think that I'm an expert. How do these people believe this about me? So among these individuals and others, there are some noticeable patterns about who falls susceptible to imposterhood. For example, introverts are far more likely than extroverts to express self-doubt about their abilities. The same goes for individuals from overly demanding families with overly demanding parents. The idea, for example, that your mother might love you only once you win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Women in particular are especially susceptible to imposterhood, especially at the workplace. Yet, in the focus on psychological characteristics and personal backgrounds, perhaps we've missed something. What if imposterhood is perhaps more systemic than we think, something less individual, something more related to the way that work is structured? So as an academic, I've had personal experience with this myself. I entered my PhD with an intention to build knowledge and to shed light on a topic. Instead, I graduated with a better sense of how vast the darkness was around what I knew. So imposterhood didn't end there, though. I subsequently became a business school professor, and I started borrowing topics more often associated with psychology and sociology, for example, imposterhood. And now here I am at a walrus podium talking about ideas borrowed from psychology and sociology. So intellectual work and academic life can fuel anxiety, but that anxiety can also be learned and reinforced through the rituals of work and professional life. And it's common, not just for academics. In a recent British survey, one third of millennials reported a fear of being found out or being exposed as a fraud. This is strikingly higher than just a generation ago. What is it about modern work that catalyzes imposterhood? I'd like to highlight a few drivers. There's our economy, for instance, that systematically devalues people who make or do things. Think of nurses, tradespeople, sanitation workers, artists, in favor of more prestigious occupations, such as auditors, lawyers, consultants. We now have, we now have our organizations populated with, perhaps, image consultants, compliance officers, legal advisors, social media managers, corporate lobbyists, and then there's also job inflation. Titles like vice president or executive director are given out like Halloween candy, irrespective of whether those people are actually doing any executive directing or vice presiding. <laughs> so the outcome of all this is a wide swath of the workforce that reports feelings of worthlessness, despite being educated and holding well-paid, prestigious jobs. These individuals are increasingly talented, but less able than ever to derive purpose and satisfaction from their efforts. In a recent survey, again in the UK, only half of respondents found their jobs to be meaningful. A full 37% reported that their work did not provide any meaningful contribution to society at all, and those respondents actually thought that the world would be better off if their professions never existed. Isn't that striking? That the average worker has attained more education than her parents, but is less likely to find societal or personal value in her work. So what are the effects on well-being? Well, one of the more insidious effects of imposterhood is that it offers opportunities for exploitation. Many high-profile firms, 
especially McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, for example, proudly parade their tough recruitment, selection, and initiation rights. Imagine going through brain teasers, grueling multiple round interviews, induction retreats, beating out 95% of other applicants. After making it through all of that, would it be any surprise that these new recruits feel, uh, would report feeling immensely grateful for being chosen to join this elite club? Would it be surprising that these recruits would readily sacrifice their personal lives and mental health in order to prove their worth? So how do we man manage imposterhood? And in doing so, how do we improve wellness? I suggest that part of the solution involves re refocusing the goals and incentives of organizations. We know that social processes like mentoring do much to it dispel anxiety. The problem is that these aren't valued as much as technical outcomes. As an academic, my feelings of self-doubt are alleviated not by my publications or my outputs, but through my collaborations with peers who I respect and my friends. But is there anything more short-term that can be done? So the early psychologists who studied imposterhood found that simply talking about self-doubt had therapeutic value. I can attest to this myself. After hearing the stories of so many people who grapple with self-doubt, at least I know I'm in good company. And even if I don't win a Nobel Prize, I'm pretty sure my mom is okay with that. <laughs> Thank you. I have to say I'm pretty nervous about following Joel's great talk about imposterhood. <laughs> um, my name's Don Schmidt, um, and I'm an architect, and I work with a wonderful team of, of architects um, in our practice, Diamond Schmidt Architects. But what I want to talk about is urban community. Um, we are a very gregarious species. We come together to form urban places, not only producing the value of goods and services, the trade of those services, but we draw support from social connection. We charge our imagination with a collision of ideas. We create culture out of these collisions. The city is a place of gathering and shared experience where the artist meets its largest, their largest audience. And we draw strength from the energy of that urban community. In fact, the experience of urban life and its institutions is really central to the way we live at this moment, more so than at any time in, in history. The great concentrations of us are in cities. How do we shape these places that define how we live now? Do we believe the widely held idea that cities are a kind of grand accident, an uncontrolled consequence of growth and change? City form is always determined by a multiplicity of decisions made by those who govern, who finance, who plan, who develop. Increasingly, however, that multiplicity of decisions is profoundly affected by all of us who join the conversation and for, by those who actually live in the city. There have been moments in history and places which demonstrate the building of cities in, in, on occasion as one of man's greatest achievements. In certain locations and circumstances, the forces that shape urban form uh, interact with such clarity that a, perf a place of profound character is shaped. In Ottawa, in the, in the early 19th and early 20th century, the exuberance coming from the strengths of a young country built precincts in this city that were fresh and daring. Edmund Bacon in a, wrote about Ottawa in a survey of, about cities, none was more glorious or more exp expressive of a vast regional concept than the capital of Canada. He talks about the relationship to the wild landscape, the escarpment along the river, the precincts of the government buildings, the crown, and the urban counterpoints in the town. He refers to, quote, the superb way in which the design of the pyramidal parliamentary library dominates the sweep of the Ottawa River, establishing a pivotal point in space. 
asserting a place of community within that in counterpoint to this great, wild Canadian landscape. The city is not static. This city is not static. How we live now is shaped by the continuous adjustment of our priorities, our cultural expectations, our attitudes about openness, accessibility, diversity in all our, our communities. I want to talk about six institutions and how those institutions transform as part of a continuous process of renewing how we live. The arts, how can we open up what were cloistered institutions to embrace the kind of broad uh, and more diverse society that we are developing? How with heritage and governance and the politics of governance do we open up what were um, New, what, what are possible to be new uses layered together with heritage and complexity, creating new meaning and, and uh, through the continuum of heritage. How do we understand in science and technology the history of the inventions and technology that enabled our first and second industrial revolutions and are the foundations on which we are beginning the third uh, revolution of a new green economy? Sustainability, how do we look at natural systems which are beginning to re-emerge as powerful in the city as systems, not simply green space, but as systems that heal? How do we think about learning, um, the learning and discovery is continuous, active, lifelong, experiential, outside the class and creating community, and how in the new library and Library and Archives Canada here in Ottawa, can we create a crossroads of community and um, gathering in a digital age? Let's begin with arts. At the National Arts Centre, the country built a remarkable icon of brutalist enclosed architecture 50 years ago, primarily a place accessed by cultural and political elites. The transformation reconnected to the landscape was built out of wood structure, opened and created lobbies of living uh, space 16 hours a day, yoga in the morning, daycare, talks, performance. We connected to Confederation Square, connected to the city, opened to the community, and created something that was truly national in its beacon that broadcasts across the country. Adaptation. Ottawa brought rail into the center of the city, into the parliamentary precinct. Um, interestingly enough, at a time when, and that rail disappeared at a time when rail is re-emerging. But when the rail was removed, the station was closed and became derelict. But these extraordinary public spaces can be honored in a way that both captures history, but also revives in a new way with new, uh, the new Senate, heritage enclosure, clad in bronze, pixelated with the iconic photography of Canadian landscapes, the great landscapes of the West Coast and the East Coast and the North. At the Ingenium on, on Saint Laurent, the Center for Collections, Conservation and Curatorial Practice at the Museum of Science Technology is a cabinet of curiosities, a wunderkammer which houses an incredible collection of artifacts which really draw, drove the first and second industrial revolutions. And it's a place of magic where you can understand what preceded the technologies and innovation on which we continue to build. We know we, were, we are in a, in a climate emergency. We know that our children have demanded that we wake up. We know we have the ability to eliminate hydrocarbon use. We know we can reduce our carbon footprint to zero. At the University of Ottawa, we demonstrated living biofilter technology which can reduce indoor air pollutants by 90% and create a community crossroads at the center of the academic precinct. It's a place of beauty where community forms and it marks that place in the campus. We know that a place of learning and collaboration at, at, 
Algonquin College can be open, give space to the understanding that much of what we learn is outside the classroom in the gathers and serendipitous interactions which shape us as individuals and as members of society. And finally, we can create through the new library um, and Library and Archives Canada a crossroads in a way that creates accessibility, that connects with landscape, that has as its heart a town square, that connects to the landscape and the distant views, um, but is a space shaped by community, shaped by accessibility um, as a crossroads. So in revitalizing these six institutions, we change the way we live. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anahid Dashgard. I am many things, co-founder of Anima Leadership and author of the recent memoir, Breaking the Ocean, Race, Rebellion and Reconciliation. I'm going to talk about that how, uh, in order to live well, we need to feel a sense of belonging. We all know what that feels like. It's that feeling of walking, walking into a room with a handful of our favorite people and the self that shows up in that environment. Our shoulders drop. We make more jokes without caring if anyone laughs or not. And we allow ourselves to be quiet. We can touch our own soul selves and meet the deepest need of the moment with the brilliance of our own knowing. We often teach, it is said, what we most need to learn. And indeed, it has been the case in my journey. The search to belong has been the defining mission in my life, one that was damaged for me in the crossing of ocean in order to reach these shores. Nayira Wahid, black Muslim American poet wrote, you broke the ocean in half to be here, only to meet nothing that wants you, immigrant. That's what it felt like for me. We left our country of origin, Iran, like many immigrants, not because of choice, but forced exile, a revolution, threats to my parents, curbed op opportunities for us kids, and arrived in small town Canada when I was nine. My experience wasn't just being chosen last for teams. It was indeed much worse than that, where it involved being spat on, being called racial slurs like Paki on a regular basis, and various other forms of social shunning. And of course, it wasn't just confined to the school environment, but it was part of the broader community. At one point, when I was 11 years old, I went after my coveted Girl Guides camping badge. And of course, it involved a camping trip. I don't remember a lot of that excursion, but I re what I remember is a particular moment of standing in the communal kitchen where the girl guide leader, an older white woman, asked me to hand her the manual can opener. Now, I did not know what that looked like. Like many immigrant parents, my, 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 my mother um, was making ends meet, working part-time in the housewares department at the Bay. We had an electric can opener. <laughs> what I do remember is standing rooted to the spot in that moment so scared, shame coursing through my body, afraid that I was going to get it wrong. The girl guide leader reached past me, toppling me over in the process, pulled the drawer open, grabbed the can opener, brandished it above her head, and said, you don't know what a can opener looks like? Like I was the stupidest creature in that, on earth, not just in the room. The thing is, it wasn't just that one moment. It was one of many such moments, such that I lost faith not, not, faith, not just in those around me, but more importantly, in myself. Feeling excluded was one of the driving forces that later would manifest in a number of physical and mental health struggles that started at a, at a very young age, including an eating disorder, as well as various obsessive compulsive behaviors that would reoccur through most of my adult life. And there I need to swallow some water. No coincidence. So many of us have these experiences of not belonging. We know what it's like. 
that feeling of no matter how hard we try, we're not going to measure up, not going to fit in somehow, the imposter syndrome described earlier. The impact, if you can recall, is not cerebral but primal, a jolt to the nervous system, a switch over from parasympathetic to sympathetic, um, in other words, from at ease to fight or flight. For many people, the experience of rejection is limited to a club, a classroom, a, 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 a sports team. It can be pasted over with new experiences. Yet for others, the exclusion can be ongoing. Racism, homophobia, ableism, being born into the wrong color of skin, loving the wrong gender, having the wrong mental or physical capacity. Wrong, wrong, wrong. In such systems, the impacts are frequent, daily, oppressive. It's easy to become hypervigilant, rarely at ease in one's own skin. How does one live well in systems that regularly discriminate against certain identity groups, indigenous people, people of color, women, those that identify as being LG, LGBTQ to us, keeping them in a position of feeling less than? How do you learn not to self-hate? In my experience, belonging is both a personal and a collective experience. It's working to self-love while also working for justice. In every institution that I walk into as a speaker, educator, and consultant, I hear the stories, the many stories of people who learn over time to cut off 20, 40, 60, sometimes 80 percent of who they are because they, they have learned that they have to in order to survive. The black teacher who has learned to be so careful so as not to offend white parents. The people who learn to shorten their names because others can't be bothered to learn or pronounce them correctly. The women who have to work twice as hard for half the recognition whose ideas only get validated when they come out of the mouths of men. Belonging is not a random experience. Belonging is tied to how much we fit into the social norms or what is considered normal in the historical moment that we are born into. Belonging is about social power. When I moved to Canada, the vast majority of all the teachers, community leaders, judges, and police were all white people. Although some of that has changed, a lot of it hasn't, especially in key decision-making roles across our nation. That's a problem. We can have good, good intentions and still unintentionally discriminate. Although I'm a content expert now with over two decades plus experience, I still regularly walk into rooms with one of my white employees and watch people's attention, questions, and compliments skew towards them. These unintentional exclusions or micro inequities are as painful in a way as the more overt forms of discrimination I encountered when younger, more so in some ways because they are both ubiquitous and invisible. The bleeding is internal. The emotional labor in determining whether to interrupt or to swallow. Either way, there is risk involved. Our identity always shapes our experience of belonging. In closing, watch who you gravitate towards. Become aware of what parts of your own identity make things easier or perhaps more challenging. Which parts give you more access to voice and power and which less so. Creating more diversity in our country and communities is easy. Creating equal access to belonging takes work, and it is the noblest work. For people's sense of belonging determines nothing less than how well they get to live. For doesn't everyone deserve to feel safe in their own skin, to find their place on this mad human journey, to speak truth, to love fiercely, and to cry belonging as our birthright? is what a good life is all about. Thank you. Tansi, I am going to speak about living better from a position of loss. 
I'm Krista Couture. I'm mixed Cree and Scandinavian. I'm a writer, a singer-songwriter, and a broadcaster. I'm also an amputee. If you can see me, it's fairly evident. I wear a prosthetic leg that's covered in flowers. I had bone cancer when I was a kid, and uh, the cure for that cancer was to amputate my leg above the knee when I was 13. I am also a mom. <laughs> I have three children, my daughter who is two, and my sons who would be 13 and 10 if they were still alive. But uh, my first son died as a newborn, and my second son died at 14 months old. When I hear living better, I think of things like, it gets better, and there's always hope. Those are two statements I've been told a lot, <laughs> and uh, two statements I take issue with. Because while they're sometimes true, they're just objectively inaccurate. It doesn't always get better. It can get worse. And there isn't always hope. Frequently, yeah, there's hope, sure. Often it makes sense to be hopeful, but there are situations in this life that are truly hopeless. And I can tell you from experience that it only makes things worse to call them anything else. We live in this feel good and get over it culture where grief, despair, heartache, pain, and sorrow just aren't very welcome. We want to dress them up. We won't invite them to the party unless they at least come as the plus one of bright side or silver lining. <laughs> Otherwise, in the face of our get over it culture, it can feel like it's a crime to infringe upon someone else's good time if you happen to be having a hard time. As a person with a disability, better is tied very much to um, an ideal. It can mean more able <laughs> slash less disabled. And some people think it's better to not have a disability than it is to have one. And that line of thinking is harmful. It implies that a disabled life is less than. And that kind of thinking, that, that type of better, extends beyond disability. Our culture thinks a lot of things are better when it comes to our bodies. It's better to be thin, to be tall, cisgender, white, and have four limbs. Like you, I am constantly faced with images, stories, and narratives of a homogenous body that doesn't look like mine. And my body it only has one leg. It's not going to get better. It's not going to grow back. I'm not a starfish. <laughs> so in an unambiguous move to accept my body is when I decorated my prosthesis with the flowers, and that made it different. This is what I offer as an alternative to better. Different. In the months after my first son died, in the months after my second son died, I often wondered, what if it doesn't get better? What if I never feel better? The heaviness, the weight of grief, the restrictions of living with grief, I thought, what if this is it? Okay? Except all around me were those messages that suffering is not okay. It's not allowed. It's tolerated for a little while, but then get better. Get over it. Suffering is this buzzkill. <laughs> it cramps the style of the motivational speeches and the gratitude practices and the Facebook and the Instagram feeds that keep telling us, having such a good time, doing a great job, getting better all the time. And it's a lot of pressure on a broken heart and on a disabled body. So I set my sights, instead of better, on different. Years later, there have been positive changes in my life. I have things in my life, in my work, in my family that I love and cherish that are different from if I hadn't had cancer and lost my leg, that are different from if my sons hadn't died. And I can say they are wonderful, but I can't say they're better. So what I want from you, from us, <laughs> is to stop saying better and start saying different. And of course, I mean, there's so many areas where better makes sense, living better and doing better. Climate crisis and ableism and transphobia and just the petty fight you had with your friend and absolutely let's do better in all those places. <laughs> but when it comes to experiences with grief, injury, illness, any great loss, we don't have to get better. This is 
kind of a version of the serenity prayer, you know, that God grant me the wisdom to accept the things I cannot change. Except for me, the words God and prayer and serenity kind of make me twitch. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I've also heard this referred to as grounded hope, and that I can get behind. A, a hope or an intention that is based not on something unrealistic, but on what is happening, what we actually have, what's possible, and on what's not possible. I don't know how you've handled suffering so far in this life, yours and uh, that of others. But the next time you encounter a hopeless situation, when there is something that can't be replaced or rebuilt, consider that in order to feel better, you might have to accept it's not going to get better. But I promise you, definitely will be different. Ecosse, thank you. Hello, my name is Krista Byers Heinlein. Four years ago, my daughter Julia was born. I speak English and her dad speaks French, so we decided we'd raise her bilingual. And I have to say, the stakes were pretty high. Um, first, because I'm like every parent, I want what's best for my child. Um, <clears throat> but second, uh, because as it happens, I'm a developmental psychologist who studies how babies grow up bilingual. <laughs> and uh, as my husband pointed out, if Julia didn't turn out bilingual, there goes my credibility. <laughs> In my research, I want to understand how we can help babies to become proficient, vibrant bilinguals. And this is important to families like mine. A quarter of the families raising young children in cities like Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and Ottawa. Do these babies have what it takes to, turn, to learn two languages? Would Julia and other babies like her be confused? And how can we actually know what babies know, right? So it turns out that some of the usual ways that psychologists do research don't work very well with babies. So, I've tried questionnaires, they just eat them. Uh, getting them to press computer buttons, their fingers are too small. Um, no, to figure out what babies know, we need to take advantage of their natural, natural behaviors and reactions. So luckily, young babies really suck, literally suck. And in one study, we used that to figure out if newborn babies could tell two languages apart. So just like you can train a little mouse to press on a bar to get a food reward, you can actually train a newborn baby to suck on a pacifier to get something that they find rewarding, like the sound of a human voice. So that's exactly what we did. Every time babies in our study sucked on the pacifier, we played them a sentence in English. And at first they were really excited, they sucked a lot, um, but after a few minutes they kind of got bored with hearing the same language over and over, and they sucked less and less. And when that happened, uh, we switched the language. So started playing a different language like Filipino. The babies increased their sucking. They were excited to hear something new. The babies were only two days old, still in the hospital, but already they could tell two languages apart. We can also use babies' looking patterns to tap into their knowledge. So for example, we can show them pictures of different objects on a screen and measure their looking using an automatic eye tracker. So we show them a ball and a dog and they hear something like, look at the dog. If they look longer at the dog than the ball, it suggests that they understand the word dog. In one study with bilingual babies, we also played sentences like, look at the chien. So, ooh. <laughs> So, still naming the dog, but switching the language in the middle of the sentence. Bilingual toddlers who were only a year and a half old, and adults for that matter, were a bit slower to understand the sentence when there was a switch in it. And their pupils actually widened in surprise. This suggests that synonyms like dog and chien 
are not interchangeable to these bilingual toddlers. They actually notice that different words come from different languages. Our research has shown over and over that bilingual babies are not confused by learning two languages. They can tell them apart from birth and know that different words come from different languages. But that doesn't mean that it's straightforward to grow up bilingual. What can we do to support these babies' language development? Well, we know that infants learn language through listening. Babies need to hear high quantity, high quality language. And unfortunately, sticking your baby in front of a Mandarin YouTube video isn't gonna cut it. Babies learn best from real people who interact with them. A common myth is that a one person, one language strategy is the best way to raise a bilingual. And that approach certainly works well in some families. But what seems to be the most important is how much babies hear each language, rather than who speaks what. And we don't exactly know what enough is, but it's probably somewhere around 25% of the time. So for a typical baby, this will be about 20 waking hours a week in each language. We also know that kids need extra emphasis on minority languages that they won't hear spoken in the wider community. As bilingual babies grow into toddlers, grow into children, we need to have realistic expectations about what bilingual development looks like. Bilinguals are not two monolinguals in one person. Another common myth about early bilingualism is that bilingual children are delayed in their language development. But actually, we know that bilingual babies learn language just as fast as monolingual babies, or maybe even faster. The trick is that they have twice as much to learn. So take vocabulary size, for example. By one and a half years, the average child can say about 50 words, whether they're monolingual or bilingual. But the monolingual will know 50 English words, while the bilingual will only know 25 English words, because they also know 25 French words. The good news is that helping bilingual babies does not require anything fancy or expensive. Living better for babies comes from high quality everyday interactions with us, whether that happens in one language or two. And what about my bilingual baby, Julia, who's now four years old? Well, I'm happy and professionally relieved to tell you that she is now fluent in both French and English. And she knows lots of other bilingual four-year-olds in Montreal who speak all sorts of different languages. The other day, she was speaking French with her friend Stella, who also speaks Italian. I suggested they could do a little language exchange. Julia leaned into Stella and explained, in English, there are two ways to say bonjour, hello and hi. And that's when I knew my bilingual baby was all grown up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Navneet Lang. Uh, I am a freelance writer, which you can probably tell by the fact that I am the most poorly dressed speaker <laughs> who has stood up here. Um, it is an extremely lucrative profession. I highly recommend that you get into it. Um, I am here to talk about uh, technology and the good life. I just kind of want to set up the context by giving you a little story. Um, in March of 2007, I signed up for a then comparatively new social network called Twitter. You may have heard of it. Uh, there is an American politician who uses it frequently. I don't know. Maybe you've heard of him as well. Um, since March 2007, uh, I have used Twitter almost every single day. So that's about 4,600 days. And I have been on Twitter maybe for, let's say, 4,580 of those days. Uh, uh, if you were ever looking to ruin your brain, that is an excellent way to do it. Um, so, a little while ago I was talking to, uh, honestly, just a random stranger on Instagram, uh, and I was complaining about being burnt out, I couldn't focus, uh, you know, I couldn't think straight, I couldn't come up with ideas, and they said, well, maybe you're, f you're feeling that way because you spend hours a day on the burning hellfire that is Twitter in 2019. Um, so, 
uh, I decided to get off Twitter for a month, uh, and the effect was that I, uh, after a couple of days, I read an, a novel in about a day and a half. Uh, I uh, started binge watching a show on Netflix called Dark, it's a German show, and then I downloaded Duolingo, I started learning German. Um, <laughs> I was cooking, I was cycling, I was going for walks. Uh, the only way it could have been more cliche is if I had literally moved into the forest and taken up woodworking. Um, so, you might expect, given that preamble, that I am here to talk to you about uh, technology being this terrible thing. But I'm actually here to talk to you about technology and the good life. And the thing that I want to kind of emphasize is that I think that uh, there is a way to kind of live the good life with technology, rather than kind of taking your phone and throwing it in the lake or setting fire to your laptop, which granted is a reasonable uh, reaction. Um, I think that there is a way to live with technology in, in a way that actually connects us uh, with the human. Um, the reason I think this is that I think the technology isn't just uh, inescapable in 2019, I also think that it is essential. One of the ways uh, to think about technology is that it isn't simply just an evolution of stuff, of tools, but it is actually the kind of the ground that constitutes the human. Um, and that is that if you think about all the things that make us human, right, agriculture, tool use, language, these are all sort of technologies that we use to kind of shape the world uh, around us. So let me give you a, a quick little bit of context about me. Uh, despite the fact that I am predominantly a technology writer, I actually have a literature background. I actually did my PhD in English literature. Um, it was an excellent use of a decade of my life. Um, <laughs> highly recommend never, ever do that. Uh, but. Um, in the English department that I was in, in York University, which is a university in the north of Toronto, in about you know, the mid-2000s, I may have been the only person in the English department who knew what a podcast was, let alone who listened to one. Um, and that is to say that it is, a con it is a context in which technology was not particularly looked upon favorably. Um, and uh, so my perspective on technology is one that always kind of combines this sense of, of my own sort of background in the humanities with this obsession that I had, for example, you know, I'm holding an iPad now. Uh, while I was sitting in the crowd over there, uh, my Apple Watch warned me that my heart rate was over 120 beats per minute. <laughs> I'm not nervous at all. Uh, so, so I guess what, what I want to say is that I'm trying to look for ways uh, in which you can find the human within technology. The problem is, in 2019, is that the way in which technology is, is structured, particularly through social media, particularly things through like Facebook and Twitter, is uh, that they are uh, kind of uh, built in a way to rob you of the human. That is, that they sap your attention, they foster discord uh, and disinformation. And so I think that um, there are uh, sort of alter alternative ways to find the human in technology. I want to give you kind of three examples of that. Uh, the first of that is the surprising return of the newsletter. Um, the, it was sort of a, you know, an old school technology, like, you know, sending out emails. Uh, but the newsletter has returned, and I think that one of the reasons that the newsletter is so much more effective as a way to sort of connect with people and ideas is that instead of the push mode of, of um, social media, in which you just get bombarded with a bunch of stuff, you actually have to ask for a newsletter. Um, this is a little bit self-interested in that I have recently started a newsletter. You can come <laughs> speak to me afterward. Um, but the other thing about newsletters is that in order to, to give feedback, you can't just leave a snarky comment or write something terrible on Twitter, right? You actually have to email a person to say, I liked this, I disagreed with it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another kind of uh, a thing that I think is worth kind of seeking out um, are uh, websites uh, that are dedicated to both the arts and ideas and community. Um, and one example of that is a, a website called Monoscop. It's mono s k o p, uh, and it describes itself as a wiki for the arts, media, and humanities. And one of the things that you can do on that website is that you can find a huge array of, of uh, theory, of art, of poetry, of literature, um, but you can also find community around those things so that you can talk uh, with other people about the ideas that you find. Um, and it's vastly different from, for example, Twitter. Um, and the other thing kind of sounds a little bit funny, um, but it is the group chat. And I, I mean the simple kind of like 
uh, idea of having a group chat or you know on WhatsApp or on iMessage or, or whatever it, it happens to be. Um, and it's something that uh, New York Magazine writer Max Reed uh, described as being like pocket, so pocket sources of interpersonal nourishment. Um, and so I think that those are kind of three ways and what, and what those, uh, that, that you can reconnect with the human in technology. Um, and whether or not I think it is, is, is possible to do that in 2019 with, as I said, the burning hellfire of Twitter, I'm not sure. But um, I think that that model of, 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 of technology and of, uh, of the internet uh, that is about the human, uh, is about intimacy, uh, is about the mind uh, and is about beauty uh, is something that is still worth striving for. And that's it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your talkers, please join me in thanking Sean McCann, Joel Bothello, Donald Smith, Anahi Dashgart, Krista Couture, Krista, two Kristas, one with a C, one with a K, Krista Byers Heinlein, and Navneet Alang. Thank you all. I'm going to invite our talkers to uh, stand up in that lovely way that we do so they can get out to the reception ahead of you and sure we can clap them out as well as Concordia. Thank you again to everyone at Concordia. Graham can lead the way and off you go. We'll see you in a few minutes. If the audience could just wait with me for a minute, that would be great. Thank you. We've now uh, produced 122 uh, evenings like this, 122 of the Walrus Talks, on every subject you can think of, which now means there are more than 800 seven-minute talkers available to you whenever and wherever you choose to watch or listen to them. They're all on our YouTube channel. You can just head to thewalrus.ca. You can also subscribe at thewalrus.ca but it's much more convenient to do so tonight. We have a table outside. You can meet the Walrus team. And just for you tonight, a subscription to our print edition of the Walrus is just $25 for one entire year. You know that fake news is cheap to make. Last week, I got a, an email from a very, what, a, what I appeared to be a very trustworthy source telling me that our beloved Alice Munro was dead. And I immediately went to talk to the editorial staff and the digital staff about getting, uh, well, doing something, but also raising up some things Alice had written for the walrus before to, to try to get ready for this awful moment. Within 30 seconds, our digital and editorial team discovered it was fake news. Um, the email address, which looked very much like Alice's publisher, McClellan and Stewart, it looked just like McClellan and Stewart's email address. The press release, which was fake, also quoted her daughter and named her with the proper name. And it all seemed, um, it all seemed very real. And with, uh, this is why we have real live human fact checkers, thank goodness, and of course, Alice is very much alive. So I am just saying, fact-based journalism is expensive, and um, all of us at the Walrus, uh, as I said, real live humans, we don't think this should be a luxury for, for any of us. So please consider joining our community of more than 2,000 donors who support independent fact-based journalism. It's a really neat thing to do between now and December 31st because we have a matching donor, dollar for dollar, anything that you donate between now and the end of the year. So a dollar becomes two and a hundred becomes 200. And you know, 50,000 becomes 100,000. 
Just throwing that in. I'm just throwing that in. But and any gift, big or small, will make an enormous, an enormous uh, impact. So you can also um, sign up for our newsletter. It's free, and uh, you could do that right out there as well, and then you won't miss any more of our walrus talks. So I'd like to thank Graham Carr, Sammy Antaki, Philippe Beauregard, Joanne Pelche, and everyone at Concordia University for your support. I want to thank the Concordia alumni for joining us tonight, thanking our national partners Inspire, Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, and Shaw. They're with us everywhere we go. And I also want to thank you to The Conversation, which is also something you can visit online for supporting the Walrus Talks Living Better. So please join us at the reception where there's food and there's drink. And if you are there, there will also be great conversation. Our friends from Air, uh, Adventure Canada are here tonight. At their table, you could enter to win a once-in-a-lifetime trip from Resolute Bay, Nunavut, to Greenland. And I think you get to return. <laughs> but, but you should ask them before you win that trip. Always remember, we're not the walrus. You are actually the walrus. Good night. Thank you for coming. Safe home. <laughs>